A horde of horses thunder over the steppe, their riders dressed in leather. Their bows are recurved and ready to rain death upon their enemy. And the city that is their target trembles before them. In the vast expanse of fantasy world building, few cultures captivate our imagination as deeply as nomadic steppe people. With the wind in their hair and the earth beneath their horses, these nomads weave tales of adventure, conquest, and intricate societal bonds. But what were the historical facts? How did these people live? Why were, why were they so good at warfare? And how can you use them in a fantasy world? That is what we'll talk about today. Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. Just before we get started, this video has been available to members of my channel for some time now. If you want to help me make more content and you want to get early access to my videos, you can pick up a Wood membership to my channel for a mere 7 euros a month. And a shout out to Dylan Butters and Mr. Marmello, the latest members of my channel, who make these videos possible. Okay, enough of that. Let's talk about steppe nomads. To start with, let's define nomadic people. Nomads are communities that move from one place to another rather than settling permanently in one location. There are nuances here. While true nomads or full nomads have no permanent homes, semi-nomads might move seasonally perhaps spending winters in one location and summers in another, or perhaps moving with the seasonal spring floods, or perhaps they spend most of the year moving, but they have fixed winter camps. This, of course, contrasts with sedentary peoples. That, those are peoples that live in permanent settlements like towns or cities. The Mongols, as an example, were a mostly semi-nomadic. They moved their herds to fresh pasture seasonally, but they did have established bases. Uh, by contrast, the Dothraki from Game of Thrones are more fully nomadic, with their vast colossars roaming the open grasslands and only vias Dothrak providing any kind of stability, and that being more of a festival town or a place to gather for ceremonies. So if you're doing your so when you're drawing up your nomadic people if you're establishing a nomadic people in your culture of your world one of the first questions that you want to look at is how nomadic do you want them to be are you looking at a people who move from a winter camp and then roam over a set area or are you looking at a fully nomadic people who continuously live on the hoof, as it were? Because this will inform what kind of legends and ceremonies they have. For example, if they have no fixed basis, there's not even a Vias Dothrak, then you're going to need to establish patterns of how they get together as a people, because they're not going to travel as a whole people, right? They're going to travel, travel in tribes. So once you've got your tribes established, why would the tribes get together for great celebrations? Is there some kind of a fixed camp? Do they send messengers and arrange a place? That's the kind of questions you need to answer for fully nomadic people. For semi-nomadic people, it's easier because you can set up like a winter camp, you can set up a city that they gather in periodically, or you can set up a vast Dothrak where they go for ceremonies and to meet with the other tribes. And if you enjoyed this brief overview of nomadic people and semi-nomadic people and sedentary people, hit the thumbs up button and let's talk about life on the moon. So, focusing in on steppe nomads like the Mongols and the Dothraki and so on, let's talk about what their everyday life was like. It was a symphony of movement and adaptability and survival. From the Scythians of the ancient world, 
To the mighty Mongols, the vast Eurasian steppe has been home to countless nomadic people, each with their unique traditions and way of life. So let's delve a little deeper in there and understand this world better. First, we should talk about housing. The Mongols lived in tents that were portable and could be easily assembled and dissembled. The Mongols' yer or yurt is perhaps the most iconic, with its circular structure and wooden frame covered with felt. Dothraki tents in fantasy works echo this design. The tent's circular shape was ideal for withstanding the strong steppe winds, and it could be easily assembled. But it doesn't have to be a tent. The Scythians, possibly the world's first nomadic warrior people, traveled around in covered wagons. Apparently, some of these wagons were pretty substantial, to the point of having multiple rooms. So, while they maybe did set up camps and tents and so on, their wagons also provided their homes. In David Eddings' world, the Algerians might have been loosely based on this, Certainly, they traveled in covered wagons on the vast plains of Algar as nomadic horse and cattle raiders. As nomadic people, the diet of these people predominantly revolves around animal products, obviously. You're not going to farm all that much. You're only going to have plant matter that you trade for or that you can gather on the move. And we can see this in history with the Mongols, who consumed large quantities of milk, cheese like the Arul cheese, and meat, of course. Fermented mare's milk, known as Irag, was a favorite beverage among the Mongols as well. Drinking horse milk definitely seems to be a theme. In David Eddings' Algar, uh, in David Eddings's Algarians, a baby's first drink was supposed to be mare's milk in order to establish a bond with horses. And speaking of horses, these animals were absolutely the lifeblood of the steppe. Beyond transportation, they were revered, sometimes considered more valuable than gold. Horses provided milk, and in desperate times, their blood could be consumed for sustenance. The Scythians even buried elite members of their society with their horses, indicating the animal's revered status. But despite David Eddings and George R. R. Martin both using horses as transportation, this is fantasy. If you're world building and you don't want to use horses, this is a great place to introduce some strange and wonderful creatures as the transportation animal of your nomadic culture. For example, I have giant riding snakes in the desert of Kisangi. Frank Herbert uses his dune worms for his people, for his Fremen people. Or you could have dragons or giant birds. But whatever you use, the point is, your nomadic steppe people should feel a very close bond with the animal that they use as transportation. They should revere this animal. They should spend time in husbandry with this animal. The breeding of this animal must be important to them. This animal is their life's blood, and it should reflect in their attitude towards the animal, in their culture, in their myths and legends, and in their art. So, when you're setting up a nomadic people, think about what they use as transportation, and if it's an animal, that animal must be central to that culture. Of course, riding on the cold steppe all day means you need some good clothing, designed for both warmth and nobility. The Mongols wore long robes known as deal, made from cotton, silk, or wood, wool, often paired with leather boots. The Scythians wore trousers, tunics, and sometimes intricate armor with golden embellishment. They also had these straight-standing cool hats, which are just, they remind me of dunce caps, but they're kind of awesome. Tattoos were also prevalent among the Scythians, often depicting animals and scenes from myths. These tattoos possibly donated rank, achievement, or spiritual belief. While men primarily handled herding and hunting, women managed daily camp chores and childcare. 
However, it is notable that steppe women held significant power and autonomy, especially when contrasted with sedentary women. Scythian women, sometimes termed Amazon warriors by the Greeks, were known to be formidable warriors and leaders. Tomb excavations have found female skeletons adorned with weapons, reinforcing this idea. And it does make a certain amount of sense. If your whole society is on the move all the time, you want the women to be able to defend themselves and the camp in a last-ditch effort, rather than depending on fortifications and a home guard of men. So you would much more frequently see women who are trained as warriors in order to provide that line of defense against the camp being invaded and the children harmed. Both Scythians and Mongols operated on strong kinship ties. The Mongol society was divided into clans and tribes, with loyalty to one's kin being of the utmost importance. The Scythians had a similar structure, with tribes often being led by a chieftain chosen based on merit and lineage. We can see that kind of structure play out in the Dothraki as well, with the Karls and the Blood of My Blood warriors and so on. I did a similar structure with my desert nomads, where they have family groups that they travel around with, and then the tribes that they gather with for certain festivals. What I found interesting to design in these kinship structures was how one can identify people from other kubelas, as I called them. I ended up using shells and hair braids, so each kubela has a different pattern of shells braided into their hair that identifies which tribe and family they belong to. I always think that kind of visual identification in clothing gives you a lot to play with as a world builder, so think about that next time you're building kinship ties. Is there a way that people can identify kinship by just looking at another person? Speaking of kinship, in many nomadic societies, marriages solidified alliances between tribes. Bride kidnapping, although not universal, was practiced among some Mongol tribes. The Scythians had a dowry system, and archaeological evidence suggests they celebrated marriages with grand feasts and rituals. Children, of course, were an integral part of the continuation of nomadic traditions. They were educated through oral traditions, stories, and hands-on experiences. Mongol children, for instance, learned to ride horses at a very young age and were taught archery, herding, and other essential skills through observation and participation. And if you enjoyed that overview of nomadic lifestyles, Hit the thumbs up button and let's talk about society, governance and wealth. The governance style of nomadic people is quite unique. One title, however, seems to resonate across the tribes and across the time periods, and that is the title of Khan. Central to many of these societies was the Khan, a chieftain or ruler often a blend of military commander, spiritual leader, and tribal chief, the Khan was responsible for the welfare and success of the tribe. Their role wasn't just administrative. They had to maintain balance within the tribe, ensure its survival, and navigate into tribal politics. When tribes united under a single banner, often for conquest or in the face of a common threat, they'd be led by the paramount Khan, sometimes referred to as the Khan of Khan. Genghis Khan is the most prominent of these figures. Born Temyajin, he united the Mongol tribes and established one of the largest empires in history. The title signifies not just a powerful ruler, but one with unparalleled influence that extends across multiple tribes and territories. Of course, one of the primary tasks of the Khan was to coordinate the defense of the tribe's wealth. In the steppe's nomadic culture, wealth wasn't stacked in coin or measured in land holdings. 
Instead, it was counted in cattle, sheep, goats, and horses. Livestock was both currency and capital. Like the people themselves, wealth needs to be mobile. Livestock, livestock therefore, represents food, clothing, and tools. With livestock as wealth, ensuring their safety is pretty important. Herds would often be divided among family members to reduce the risk of total loss. Tribes would move their herds to more defensible or remote locations if there is evidence of risk. Additionally, treasures acquired such as precious metals or gems would sometimes be crafted into wearable items like jewellery ensuring that wealth was always close at hand and could be transported easily. Owning land wasn't about marking territory, but about ensuring the tribe's survival. Grazing rights were crucial as the health of a tribe's livestock depended on it. Tribes would move seasonally, ensuring pastures weren't overgrazed. Disputes over these rights were common, given their importance and conflict over grazing rights, livestock theft, or political power could be resolved in several different ways. Despite their reputation, dialogue was preferred where the tribal elders or the Khan would mediate. But there were also more personal disputes where duels could be used to resolve the conflicts. And for my thoughts on using duels as a means of conflict resolution and legal resolution, check out the information card. Sometimes, however, small duels or mediation just did not do the job, and there would be larger conflicts involving entire tribes or alliances, and this could erupt into war. Sometimes these conflicts would give rise to feuds that would last years and would result in significant cattle raiding, but where the tribes would actively try and decimate each other's wealth. I do want to speak here about cattle raiding specifically because it wasn't just a means to defeat an enemy. It could also be a rite of passage in many nomadic cultures. For young warriors, it was a way to prove their bravery and secure some personal wealth. For the tribes, it could be both a strategy to weaken rivals and to replenish their own stock. So, some raids would be small and it would be a contained affair between warriors. I can imagine a scenario where even friendly tribes could be raided with recompense then made or, you know, raiding back and forth in a kind of friendly rivalry as opposed to the enmity of a feud because young men do need to earn their adulthood and prove their mettle as warriors. So think about your raiding structure and how the clans might count coup among each other with their... Uh, activities in that department. So, returning to the Khan, how was the Khan chosen? While lineage often played a role, Khans were also chosen on merit, particularly their leadership in battle or their wisdom in governance. In the case of the Mongols, a Kurul Thai or grand assembly of chieftains and influential figures would be held to elect a new Khan. While lineage and nobility did matter, you did have to come from certain lines. The elected Khan had to be capable, otherwise the unity and strength of the tribe was diminished. In this way, they tried to choose the best candidate from a pool limited by nobility. So if you enjoyed this discussion of the larger society and governance, consider giving this video a super thanks and let's talk about spirituality and religion on the open steps. Nomadic societies with their deep-rooted connections to the vast landscapes they traversed developed spiritual beliefs that intertwine with nature. Their reverence for the land, the skies and the cycles of life and death were reflected in their religious practices and their ceremonies. 
central to many nomadic beliefs is animism, the world view that all things, be it animals, plants, rivers, mountains, or even celestial bodies, have spirits. This profound connection to nature was not just about reverence, but about survival. Respecting and understanding spirits meant harmony, essential for the tribes whose lives depended on the whims of nature. And for my thoughts on animism, check out the information card. Ancestor worship also played a pivotal role in the spiritual lives of many nomadic tribes. They were seen as guiding spirits, offering wisdom and protection. Shrines, artifacts, or even specific rituals might be dedicated to them. Invoking the spirits of ancestors before battles or hunts or major decisions was a common practice. Shamans were the tribe's guides in this, the spiritual leaders, intermediaries between the natural and the supernatural realms. Equipped with knowledge passed down through generations, they conducted rituals, divination, and healing practices. A shaman's power lay in their ability to communicate with spirits, seek guidance, heal the sick, and even influence weather patterns for the benefit of the tribe. Their attire, often adorned with symbols, feathers, and beads, reflected their unique and elevated status within the tribe. While the Khan led in matters of governance, warfare, and the tribe unity, the shaman wielded significant influence in spiritual and cultural realms. The Khan might make decisions based on the advice and divination of the shaman. It wasn't a matter of one superseding the other, but rather a symbolic relationship. A Khan's might and leadership, paired with a shaman's wisdom and spiritual guidance, ensured the tribe's holistic well-being. But if a Khan went against the shaman's wisdom, the clan might very well rebel. So when you're creating your own nomadic society, think about including that kind of potential tension between the spiritual and temporal leader. It is always a fantastic place to build tension and conflict into stories. Of course, spirituality and religion is also strongly connected with life ceremonies, so let's discuss those in a nomadic context as well. First, birth. Welcoming a new member was celebrated with rituals to invoke protection and good fortune for the child. Coming of age was often marked by tasks or ceremonies to signify the transition from childhood to adulthood, as we spoke about in cattle raiding. Marriage. Not, marriage was not just a union of two individuals, but often a binding of families and even tribes, and as such was celebrated by gatherings between these tribes. And finally, death. Funerals were significant, ensuring the departed spirits found its way and continued to protect the tribe. Remember, they had ancestor worship, so funerals were very important. The guidance of the ancestors was critical. The Scythians, for example, had elaborate burial rituals with graves reflecting the individual status. Now, all of these ceremonies that I've spoken about so far were about the individual, and they took place during the travel of the tribe. But there were larger festivals and gatherings as well. Nomadic tribes had festivals celebrating seasonal changing, successful hunts, or religious events. Given the vast territories that they covered, these events were opportunities for the tribes to meet, to exchange news, to trade, and even to find potential spouses. Now, possibly these ceremonies could have been held on the open grasslands, but it could also be that these nomadic societies gathered somewhere for specific ceremonies. While places like Gubekli Tepe's exact purpose remains a topic of debate, it is plausible that such sites could have been communal spaces for religious rites and gatherings for nomadic tribes. Certainly, we can see such gathering places clearly in fantasy with the Dothraki's Vice Dothrak in Game of Thrones and the Algerian Citadel 
in David Eddings's work. And if you enjoyed this discussion of spirituality and religion, hit the thumbs up button and let's talk about war. The image of a steppe warrior astride a swift horse and wielding a composite bow is not just a captivating vision, but a testament to their unparalleled mastery over cavalry warfare. Let's first talk about the weapons that work with steppe nomads. A marvel of the ancient engineering, the composite bow was constructed from layers of wood, horn, and sinew. This gave it greater strength and flexibility than simple wooden bow. Its shorter length made it easier to handle on horseback, allowing riders to shoot even while galloping, something that requires enormous skill. But it wasn't just the bows. Steppe warriors often carried multiple types of arrows suited for different purposes, from armor-piercing bodkins to broader-bladed varieties. You could even go for fire arrows or magic arrows here. A fireball delivered by an arrow shot could be all kinds of fun and games for war. And of course, once you're past the shooting stage, you do need a sword. The preferred weapon was scimitars. These curved blades were perfect for slashing opponents while riding by at speed. When you're designing a sword for cavalry, you almost always want to use a bladed weapon. You want to be able to chop as you ride past someone, and for that, a broad-bladed weapon is better than a weapon made for it with a stabbing tip. If you want to do stabby stuff on horseback, you want to focus on spears and lances. Useful for both throwing and close combat, they could be employed against foot soldiers and other cavalry. And because your warriors are mounted, the power of the horse is also behind that spear or lance, making it a very powerful strike. Now, always on the battlefield, you do have to think of protection. Lightweight leather and later laminar or scale armor provided protection without compromising mobility. Helmets and shields were also used, tailored for mounted combat. But when you get right down to it, it wasn't their equipment that made the Mongols a feared force on the Eurasian steppe. So let's talk about tactics. The Mongols had three favorite tactics. Now, listen, I'm not a military student, so take this with a pinch of salt, but this is my understanding based on the research I've done. First, hit and run. Relying on speed and agility, steppe warriors would approach, unleash a volley of arrows, and then swiftly retreat before the enemy could effectively respond. Second, a feigned retreat. This tactic is designed to break enemy formations. Warriors would pretend to flee in panic, luring the enemy into a chase, only to turn around and then ambush them once the enemy was stretched thin and vulnerable. And lastly, encirclement. Often, smaller detachments would engage the enemy head-on, while larger forces circled around the attack, uh, circled around to encircle the enemy like this. All of these tactics depended on the speed and agility of their mounts and their skill in riding them. But they also depended on good battlefield communication. The Mongols used drums, flags, and smoke to convey orders across the battlefield. They also established an intricate relay system known as the YAM. Swift riders would relay messages across vast distances, ensuring that commanders remained informed and could call for reinforcements or supplies as needed. Sometimes, however, they did come up against walled cities or other fortifications. And if you want some help designing fortifications, check out my video on the topic in the information card. Anyway, how did Mongols overcome fortifications? While the Mongols started primarily as a cavalry force, their expansion brought them into contact with various people, including Chinese engineers who were adept in siege warfare. The Mongols assimilated this knowledge and began employing siege engines like catapults, trebuchets, and battering rams. 
If direct assault failed, the Mongols might resort to encircling a city, cutting off supplies and waiting out the defenders. And if that failed, well, the Mongols were known for their brutal tactics. They might use captured prisoners as shields or catapult the heads of the fallen into a city to demoralize the defenders. They also catapulted plague-infested bodies into cities in the first case of biological warfare. So fearsome was their reputation, some cities surrendered without a fight in order to avoid their wrath. So in essence, the might of the steppe warriors wasn't solely due to their skill in battle. It was a combination of their adaptability, their assimilation of foreign techniques, and their unparalleled understanding of the terrain and their own strength. Under leaders like Genghis Khan, they didn't just conquer lands, they reshaped the course of history and dramatically influenced our world today. So if you enjoyed that overview of warfare, hit the thumbs up button, and let's talk about what kind of magic works well with steppe nomads. So obviously shamanic magic works very, very well for these types of cultures. They would offer you powers like spirit commands, where shamans can call up a spirit and command it to serve the tribe. These spirits could represent elements of nature and they could serve the tribe during war or, you know, for protection or whatnot. Or your shamans might have elemental mastery. So drawing on the vastness of their homelands, the shamans might manipulate the sands of the desert or summon gusts of wind or call down thunderstorms. Their rituals, dances and chants can focus the raw energy of nature into this elemental magic. You could also lean into that ancestral aspect. You could have ancestral spirits infuse weapons or have ancestral spirits offer direct guidance to chosen, you know, members of the clan. And you might have a blade that, you know, so you might have a blade that ignites with ethereal fire or you might have a bow that always shoots true guided by an ancestral spirit or something like that. So you could take your shamanism and lean into elemental magic, into spirit command magic, or really dig into that ancestral magic, or even make it a combination of all three. But shamanic magic isn't the only type of magic that works well on the steppe. With a connection to horses or whatever fantastical beast you want to use for your um, transportation, animal magic works really well. So this is magic based around animal power. So this could give you things like bonding with a beast where, you know, you could have people specifically bond with a specified beast that gives them mastery. I do this in Kisangi, my desert nomads bond with a specific snake and this becomes their snake. Or you could go even further and lean into shape shifting where, you know, you have people that can specifically shape shift into that and either the animal that is the transportation or another animal uh, or you can have scouts that are falcons and all of those kinds of abilities and if you want my thoughts on shapeshifters I did make a video about them you could also lean into animal summons so you can have your shamans or your magic users within the tribe be able to summon animals to the tribe in order to provide them with transportation or food or even to create a stampede to make their enemies flee before them. When you're designing your magic system, think about your, how your nomadic people live and embed the magic into their lives. You want the magic system to be deeply rooted in the ethos of the steps. You want it to be something that fits with the culture of the people that you are designing. Think about what is important to them and build the magic system around that aspect of their life. And those are my thoughts on including nomadic step people in fantasy worlds. Let me know in the comments what other cultures you would like me to cover and as you leave the building, check out my books on the way out. And if you enjoyed this video, you might also enjoy my video on creating deserts in a fantasy world. It does help the algorithm if you click on that video. So please go ahead and do that. And I will see you soon for another episode.